I'll hand it over to our next speaker, Dr. Victor Rios. Thank you, Thank you. <clears throat> wow. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, David. It's, it's been an honor to work with you. And um, every year or so, I meet a couple students from Santa Maria, and um, they're definitely a blessing to our UCSB community. You know, the goal of the UC system should be the same as the goal of the community college system, um, which is to educate uh, the local uh, population that represents the state of California and our local communities. Unfortunately, uh, we don't see as many locals, uh, Central Coast uh, students as I would like to see. So please keep sending them to UCSB. I know you do a great job sending them to other institutions as well. <laughs> All right, so um, today what I want to talk with you about is the, the power of educators in the lives of men of color. and. Uh, you know, the, the theme here is really to work with marginalized students, but specifically focusing in on one particular population that uh, sometimes is harder, harder to reach than other populations uh, based on, uh, if you look at demographics, you look at uh, incarceration rates, you look at uh, dropout rates, you look out at uh, violence, victimization, uh, you look at the local news, uh, who's committing that violence or who's represented, overrepresented to commit that violence, you end up seeing that it's uh, young men of color that are overrepresented in all of these areas. So, again, the, the message is for how do we work with marginalized students and then specifically then how do, what are some strategies that work with uh, young men of color. Before I uh, continue here, I would like to uh, show you a short video clip of my story, just so you have a little background. Now, another in our series on the nation's high school dropout crisis. Tonight, one man's journey from gang member and dropout to professor, and his efforts to keep other young men from making his mistakes. Bryce Suarez has our American graduate story. My name is Victor Rios. In 1994, this was me. I was introduced to the nation in a frontline documentary. I was a gang member, a juvenile delinquent, and a high school dropout. But in the 18 years that followed, not working. It it's years, going during to his high school diploma, finished college, oh. earned a PhD in the University of California at Berkeley, and wrote two books on his life and his research on juvenile delinquency. He now teaches sociology at UC Santa Barbara and helps at-risk youth navigate the perils of adolescence. <laughs> Rios is also a family man with a wife, Rebecca, and three children. Life is constantly busy. To be this far into the future, I feel like I've lived two lifetimes. Two lifetimes. That's a very important theme in education, and this is why Many of the children that some of you educate have already lived an entire lifetime by the, the time they get to your classroom, whether they are uh, seven years old or 22 years old uh, or older when they approach the community college age and enter community college, um, maybe for their second or third time. Now, what does that mean to live an entire lifetime? Well, I'll give you an example. Uh, my brother, my older brother, he was seven years old and I was three years old and my mom didn't have a place to take us for childcare, daycare, and she worked 10 hours a day. So what did she do in the summertime? She would leave the, our apartment um, and lock the door from the outside so we couldn't open the door from the inside. And that seven year old for 10 hours would have to entertain feed um, and make sure that this three-year-old would not fall out of that second story window for 10 hours. So this seven-year-old raising his little brother, by the time he gets into his second, third grade classroom, he's already had to fend for himself. He's already had to figure out how to raise his own little sibling. And so his experience and his expectation of education is going to be very different 
and a child who has that support at home, who doesn't have to raise their younger sibling, who doesn't have to fend for themselves and figure out where the next meal is going to come from. So that's what I mean by living a, a life, an entire lifetime already. So educators have the power to provide second chances, to allow individuals to le live that life, uh, uh, that second lifetime. And, um, and it all begins when the student is, is very little. So my story begins, um, I'm about three years old, and uh, we, uh, my, my, my father wasn't around. He abandoned us before I was even born. And so uh, we um, were going hungry, we were struggling. I was born in Mexico, and so we were living in Mexico, and um, my mom decided to look for a better place with more opportunities. And one day she's talking to her tia, her aunt in Mexico, and her tia says to her, Mija, you, you have to go to the land of opportunity, a place where nobody goes hungry, where you can eat carne asada every day, <laughs> a place where um, you get a job right away, and that job you could buy a nice house for yourself and your children. Now I don't know what kind of TV shows this lady was watching. <laughs> or what she was smoking. <laughs> but my mom, she believed her. <laughs> you know, uh, that, that getting to this country would, would end up in this uh, life of solid opportunities. So uh, we tried to get across the border. We couldn't get across. We were poor. We were uneducated. Um, and so we ended up in the streets of Tijuana, Mexico. And on the streets of Tijuana, I was this little toddler begging people for money, sticking my hand out uh, so we can eat. And, and I remember vaguely uh, and hearing stories from my brother too about my mother begging people for money on the street corner, saying, por favor, un pesito para alimentar a mis hijos. Please, a penny to, to feed my kids. So desperate times for, call for desperate measures. We, uh, we struggled, almost starving, homeless. Um, one day my mom grabs my brother by the hand, puts me on her hip, takes us under this fence, this flimsy fence, and um, through the desert and behind some bushes without water or food for hours and hours. We walked through some desert streams, over some hilltops, and finally we made it to Los Estados Unidos, the land of opportunity. But when we got here, we quickly realized things weren't going to change much. You see, um, my mom, she got a job, but her boss, he, he told her, I'm going to pay you whatever I want. And if you tell anyone I'm paying you less than minimum wage, I'll call immigration so they can send you back to Mexico. So my mom, she took this little bit of money, and with this little bit of money, um, she got us this tiny little apartment in a dilapidated bu building run by some slumlord, with people suffering everywhere around us. People strung out on drugs, uh, women getting battered by their uh, partners in the middle of the night, and we would hear it. You know, this kind of scenario, gunshots going off in the corner. And one time the situation got so bad in our own household um, that it made me reflect. When I was growing up, I was getting older, it was time to make a change. And this incident is when my little cousin, he's uh, two months old, he's living with us, with his parents. And he's um, next door, he's sleeping in his crib, and uh, these uh, rats that uh, the landlord would not get rid of, uh, crawled on his crib and they began to chew his face up. They chewed his lips, his gums, his cheeks. By the time that uh, his mom got up and realized what was happening, turned on the light, uh, the baby was in a pool of blood. My little cousin ended up in the hospital for, for months and his little face had to be reconstructed. 
And so by this time, I'm in eighth grade, and I tell myself, man, I don't want to live like this anymore. I don't want to be poor. I want to get my family out of poverty. So I decided at this moment to drop out of school for the first time and to go get a job. Because I felt school, not only it wasn't paying my bills, but also it had no future for me. Because in the past, I hadn't been treated rightfully in the education system. You see, I used to love school till about third grade. And I used to uh, love reading till about third grade. And I used to go to the library and check out all these Greek mythology books stacks of them and cross this big avenue in Oakland East 14th and it you know there was no s s street lights and it was like a six lane avenue so here I am trying to cross the street from the library to get to our apartment with the stack of books literally risking my life just to read and so I would get to our apartment I wouldn't go inside it was too much chaos so I would sit outside under the stairwell on a dirt patch. And in that darkness, I would figure out a way to read these books. I loved it. I loved to learn. But in third grade, I'm sitting in the front of the class, and I knew how to read. And the teacher asked me to read a word on the board. And I nodded. And she says, Victor, I need you to read this word. And I nodded. And she starts yelling at me, and I shut down so I would not read the word. And she starts yelling at me more. And she threatens me. She says, I'm going to kick you out of class if you don't read the word. Would anyone like to guess why I was not reading the word? Raise your hand and tell me. The very back. You couldn't read. I couldn't read. I was reading Greek mythology. <laughs> Kronos. Language? I watched enough Sesame Street. Back then it hadn't been sold, sold to HBO. It was still on PBS. Yes. I couldn't see the word. Someone over there said it. I needed glasses. There's people in here wearing glasses. Take your glasses off and try to read that word. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. It wasn't until age 15 that I got my first pair of glasses. That was the dire poverty I was living in, in America, in California. And I know, because I meet these children. I was just in Oxnard with David, actually, running a program where they told us the same thing. Children there are getting in trouble because they can't see. So this is the first time I shut down from the education system. Because to be humiliated for something that wasn't my fault. I get kicked out of class. Go to the principal's office. Principal was a cool cat. He had this really nice kind of thick voice, a voice I wanted to have as, a, as an adult, but still have, it hasn't come to me yet. <laughs> Mr. Rios, son, how are you doing today? And why are you here in my office? I'm not saying a word, I'm just nodding my head. Mr. Rios, I heard what happened in that classroom. Why won't you read the word? Mr. Rios, son, look at me in the eyes when I'm talking to you. He gets mad. He never loses his cool, but he lost his cool this time with me. And he starts yelling at me. And he threatens to suspend me. And he ends up trying to get a hold of my mom and then talking to her, it's this big deal. Why did I not look at my principal in the eye? 
in some cultures, <laughs> it's a lack of respect. I was just in Omaha, Nebraska, and the teachers there told me that the Native American children in Omaha are taught not to look at elders in the eyes. For some of us, it's a sign of respect not to look at elders, authority figures in the eyes. But in America, you got to look at me in the eyes and shake my hand to close that business transaction. And he's trying to teach me an important cultural value that I'm going to need to survive in this world. But that doesn't mean he should teach me to let go of the equally important cultural value that I bring with me to the schoolhouse. You see? So children, young men of color, but children in general that come from marginalized communities, they come with cultural practices that might seem alien to the system, but that have equal value to what the system's trying to teach them. But because these practices have been criminalized at worst, or at best, been seen as not valuable, there's a lot of conflict that takes place. So we go back to the glasses situation. That's a class collision. The working class colliding with the middle class. Because all of you, even if you grew up working class, you're part of a middle class <coughs> system. Think about it. I mean, the goal of education is to bring up our children, to bring them into prosperity, to bring them into success. So the goal of our education system is to bring the working class into the middle class and above. So in many ways it makes sense that we're operating in a middle class value system because that's where we want our children to meet us, except that many times we start with that assumption. So in other words, one universal rule that might be applied formally or informally is be prepared to learn. Be prepared to learn. Well that's a middle class assumption. Being prepared to learn is assuming that I was well fed the night before, the morning of. Being prepared to learn is so charged because it's assuming that I have all my materials that I need to be prepared, that I wasn't psychologically traumatized on the way to school in that neighborhood I live in, being prepared to learn, it's such a charged middle class value and yet we operate in that value system day after day after day. So we have to really reflect, right? We're going to educate marginalized populations, we have to reflect on how our value system is often, often colliding with the value system they come from. And then the cultural collision I already talked about, right? This is, I'm taught one thing about respect and yet I'm expected to, to perform another way with respect. So who wins over? Who's right? That's the wrong question. Right? We, we teach young people to be shapeshifters. And by the way, they're already shapeshifters. Some of the toughest kids are the best shapeshifters. We don't have to teach them to be shapeshifters. We just have to value the shapeshifting and teach them how to use the shapeshifting in this conventional world we live in to succeed in academics. So I'm in eighth grade, I drop out because I lost faith in third grade and after in education anyway. It's not paying my bills. So I go to the gardener's house to look for a job, the landscaper. And uh, I asked him for a job, and he said, no. He says, you're too little, go back to school. His name was Johnny. I said, Johnny, man, pay me whatever you want. Oh, pay you whatever I want. Okay, get in the car, let's go. I had got a job, and it felt good to have a job. I was going to push lawnmowers and, and earn enough money to pay the bills 
to pay for the electricity bills because sometimes we had to run an orange extension cord from the neighbor's houses to get a light bulb. I was going to earn enough money and save it and maybe buy my mom the house she always wanted. That was my illusion. It was my dream. One thing that's guaranteed about the working class is that they're going to have a hard work ethic. And it's our job as educators to translate the hard work ethic into smart work ethic. So, so we value that you have a hard work ethic now let's, let's use that as a stepping stone to create a smart work ethic. And once these youngsters make that cl transition, clicks in their head that, that, that hard work is also smart work or school work is also hard work, right, is when they start performing better. They start pushing lawnmowers. I'm at the rich people's houses pushing lawnmowers. One day I'm at this lady's house, rich lady's house. She has a beautiful three-story house with a Spanish towel roof. I go to the back of her house. She has a swimming pool with little waterfalls coming down. She even has a statue of a little boy peeing in the pool. <laughs> I go to the front of the house, this lady rolls up in a baby blue Mercedes Benz. This lady's older, she has curly white hair, she gets out of her car and she's holding a little white dog with curly white hair. <laughs> and I say to myself, man when I grow up I want this house, I want this swimming pool, I want those waterfalls, I want that little boy peeing in the pool. <laughs> I want that baby blue Mercedes Benz and I want the dog with the curly white hair. <laughs> and if I work hard enough, I'll get these things in life. I was living in an illusion. So I was a dreamer, but I wasn't a striver yet. Every child is a dreamer. Every one of us has big dreams. But few of us are actually strivers. The difference between a dreamer and a striver is that the striver knows day to day on a very practical, pragmatic basis what it's going to take to get to that dream. The dreamer is just dreaming. So I was just dreaming but I wasn't striving. So the job of an educator is to turn dreamers into strivers. So I'm dreaming big. At the end of the day, 10 hours a day of work, Johnny's paying me $10 a day. So I start saving my money. And I bought just basic stuff. Shoes, food. My mom finds out that I'm out of school a few weeks, a couple months actually. You know, back then we barely had a phone on and off. School couldn't get a hold of her. And she tells me, I, I risked my life taking a lot of abuse from men just to get a basic, like, basic roof over your head. I, I need you to go back to school. So I go back to school for my mom, but then I start, I start getting caught up in the street life. And uh, with the wrong crowd, start stealing cars, uh, go to juvie for uh, Grand Theft Auto. I didn't learn my lesson, got back out, put me back in, and the guy, the, uh, the juvie guard says to me, hey, you were here a few weeks ago, you didn't learn your lesson, I'm going to teach you a lesson. And I'm a tough kid, so what am I going to say? Bring it on, let me see your lesson. What kind of lesson you got for me? <laughs> He's like, I got a lesson for you. They already had humiliated me, told me the cliche things, on drop the soap, you know, all that stuff. Try to scare me straight, that kind of stuff. Didn't work. Well, this was his lesson. He put me in a cell with an older boy, a 17-year-old boy that was really tough and had a reputation for beating up people when he was locked up. And I was scared, I'm not going to lie, and I go in there, and I'm like trembling and sitting in the corner and not making eye contact with this guy. 
And he says, hey, little homie, what you in for? Uh, I, st I, I stole a car, man. What kind of car, little homie? Um, this old, like, old bucket, man, like a 82 Toyota Tercel, man. <laughs> Come on now. If you're gonna steal his car, steal a nice car, man. Well, you know, I just learned on the street that you, you know, you steal these old cars, you just take an old Toyota key, any old Toyota key, and you scrape it on the cement, and it gets so thin that it opens any Toyota car and any Toyota ignition. That's how I stole it. Now, nah, little homie, let me teach you. This is how you steal a high performance Chevrolet Camaro Z28 or a Buick Grand National when you get out of here. You go get a long screwdriver from the flea market. It's gonna cost five bucks, but it's gonna be a good investment for you. <laughs> <laughs> he says you, you, you pop the window, you slide, it slides open, you stick your little skinny, lanky arm in there, you unlock it, and you break the steering column I can't believe I'm saying this on camera, by the way. <laughs> and you pull the rod, and you got yourself a high-performance vehicle. Oh, thank you. Thank you, man. Yeah, yeah, little homie, I got you. I got you. This is the lesson the system taught me. You see what I'm trying to tell you, educators? That in our society, we're so bent on teaching kids with harsh discipline, whether it's in school with zero tolerance, or whether it's in juvie with, you know, scared straight tactics, or, you know, having a cop come in at school and scare them or handcuff them, or, you know, and anywhere in between that spectrum. Telling them, tons of kids all over the country, I mean, and they tell me the same, almost the same line that a teacher at one point, a boy of color, has been told this. And you talk to a boy of color long enough, they'll tell you they've been, this is what they've been told. You don't prime them, they'll just tell you, growing up at some point, by an educator, you have a prison cell waiting for you when you turn 18. That's how we teach them a lesson. So in teaching them a lesson, we're turning them into what we don't want them to become. So I get out of juvie and I steal a high performance Camaro Z28 IROC. And I get caught again. Three felonies, 15 years old. Not learning my lesson. I'm not proud, but I tell you this story for a purpose. And by the way, that would have never been a good career for me because I always got caught. <laughs> so I had to let that go and leave it, yeah. So, um, and I had to pay restitution, I had to work, uh, they called it a weekend training academy where I would go and, and, and work for the county and, and then that money would get paid to the people I had victimized by breaking their vehicles. So I'm not proud of it, but I feel like I made some redemption in paying back. Um, but how I learned my lesson was actually uh, in, a very, in a very harsh way that no, no child should learn their lesson. And that's that, that um, one day I'm, um, I'm out and I'm on probation. I still don't care, still doing dumb things. And I go to the other side of town to visit uh, some girls I met um, with one of my friends that I'd grown up with since we were little. And uh, we get to the girl's house. They're sitting on their steps. They're looking really pretty. They're wearing bright red lipstick, and they had sprayed a whole bottle of Aquanet hairspray in their hair, so their hair was like that. And uh, it's like a movie, we walk in slow motion, you know. And I turn to my homeboy, and I make a bet, and I bet you five dollars I get the first kiss. All right, I got, I got five on that. So we're walking towards them, and we turn this way, and a group of our enemies are walking towards us. 
So my homeboy, he says, hey man, we, we gotta go, we're gonna get beat up. And I said, nah man, we can't leave, because if we leave, they're gonna say we're cowards. We gotta stay here and throw down. So these guys come up to us, fists are flying everywhere, I fell down. I got back up, fists are flying everywhere, fell down again, I didn't want to get back up. But that's when it happened. They pulled out a gun. I started running, my homeboy started running, I heard the gunshots, boom, 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 boom. I looked back, those guys are running away. By this time I had hidden myself between two cars, and so I'm looking for my friend and I don't see him. And I turn around the car and I see his feet. I get a little closer, I turn him around. He had been shot and he was, he was dead. And at this point in my life, I had no one to turn to. My mom, she was too busy trying to work and pay the bills and she had her own issues going on. The cops, they thought I was already a gang criminal. They weren't gonna help me. I'm sitting at a liquor store at two in the morning one night, pondering prison or death. My two choices, one of just a little muted message appeared and I remember saying oh she did she did tell me that she did tell me that one person in my life had told me she would be there for me that person was my teacher you see before leaving school, you know, I had already dropped out a couple of times, and before leaving school, I had cussed out this one teacher, Miss Russ. And she kicked me out. She kicked me out of her class. She said, you're not ready. You need to leave. And as I'm leaving her class, she calls my name. She says, Victor? And I thought she was going to tell me what every other teacher had told me when they kicked me out of my class. Don't let the doorknob hit you in the you-know-what on the way out. But that's not what she said. She said, Victor, and I turn around and she's giving me that smile that annoys me so much. And I'm mean mugging her. You're not ready right now. But when you're ready, I will be here for you. And I said, whatever, and I slammed the door and left. But the message went with me into the streets. I go back to school and I'm in a lot of pain and I'm walking down the hallway and my teacher comes out she says, Victor, are you okay? I heard what happened. I said, yeah, I'm all right. I'm trying to be a tough guy. She taps me on the shoulder and she says, I know you're not okay. And right when this lady taps me on the shoulder, all my fear, all my pain, all my anger begins to grow and I begin to cry like a little kid in front of the whole school. And I wanted to just melt away into the gutter with my tears and disappear from planet Earth. You know what this teacher did? She opened up her arms. She gave me a hug. And she said, Victor, if you are ready to change, I will be here for you. But you have to do the work. You see, educators, <laughs> sometimes our children are not going to be ready. You know, think of all the factors they face outside of your classroom. They're, they're like oysters, you know what I mean? Like, they're only going to open up when they're ready. 
right? So if we're like, oh yeah, you know, I'm, I'll help you out, I'll support you. Oh, there's this program. Oh, I want to, I want to help you out, and they're just like, whatever. We kind of give up. We turn around. We turn our backs on them. And what if we turn our backs and at that moment they open up? But we're not there. What's going to happen? They're going to close back up. She had this consistent way of showing us that when we were ready, she would be there. So, little by little, took a while. Miss Russ had to convince other teachers that I wasn't a threat. Miss Russ had to convince administration to let me back to school. She had to do a lot of hard work. Little by little, I caught up with my credits, little by little. Started getting ready to graduate on time and with my class. And right around a few months before graduation, Miss Russ came to me and she said, Victor, I'm so proud of you. I knew you could do now it's time to go to college. <laughs> college me? Man, what is this teacher smoking thinking I'm going to college? I want to be a mechanic. Not a gardener anymore, a mechanic. Okay, Victor, well, let's do this activity. Miss Russ, man, oh, you and your activities, You're, you know, why you got to stress me out, Miss Russ? <laughs> your little activities. Okay, Victor, so this one is called the reality check, and you're going to fill out your itemized monthly budget for 10 years from now. Do you want an apartment or do you want a house? You guys are laughing because you know what I'm talking about. Do you want an old car or do you want a new car? I want a new car. I want a Mercedes Benz, baby blue, Miss Russ. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, the monthly payment, uh, the average, well, let's just say $5.69 a month. And you got to pay insurance. And then you want a house? I want a house, Miss Russ. Okay, well, here's your mortgage. She multiplies the monthly by the 12, right, your yearly. She shows me Department of Labor statistics that show what a high school dropout makes, what a high school graduate makes, what a two-year graduate and a four-year graduate and post baccalaureate makes. And I'm not going to say that the words I blurted out, but I'll use an academic term for it. I had an epiphany. <laughs> In layman terms, an aha moment. <laughs> but I said, oh, now I have to go to college. For the working class, for marginalized students, for students, males of color, what we have to do is make the abstract pragmatic. Make that tenth planet realizable. Make the dream become something we could strive for, piece by piece. The minute she showed me that formula, I was like, whoa. And, I, I, and believe me, I work with students, I show them the formula, they're like, whatever. It's not gonna work every time, but when they're ready to see it, it's gonna work, trust me. Right, and, and activities and formulas like that. So, Ms. Russ says, I don't teach subjects, I teach students. Think about how we reframe, right? Yeah, you're brilliant mathematicians, you're brilliant biologists, but the subject is not what you're in education for. I always ask educators, what's your purpose? And I do an activity where they, where they write down their purpose. They never say, to be the best biology te teacher on planet Earth. They always say, my purpose is to pay it forward. 
My purpose is to give back. My purpose is to educate the next generation. My purpose is to change lives. My purpose is to help others because I was not helped by the education system. My purpose is to help others because five teachers helped me out and I want to pay it forward. So for some reason we go into education because our heart and our purpose led us there. But somehow along the way, we forget our purpose. And so she just would remind her colleagues, we don't teach subjects, we teach students. So with Ms. Russ's help, I apply to college. A few months later, I get a letter. Congratulations, you've been admitted to California State University. Whoa. What are these people smoking, letting me into college? <laughs> and then right below, you know, there's this thing, it was a special programs like EOP. You know, I, I'm a proud product of all of these incredible pro programs. Um, and so EOP was one of my programs. Summer Bridge was another one of my programs. Credit Recovery was another one. You name the program, I was in it. <laughs> and that's why I'm on stage today. If they had an Avid back then, I would have been an Avid. <laughs> I was in it. You name it, I was in it. People placed me in it, or I put myself in it, or somehow I got support. And that's what led me here. So did I pick myself up by the bootstraps? Maybe, but did the system and the society I was living in give me some straps? Because maybe I wasn't even born with straps to begin with. 100%. It takes not just people picking themselves up by the bootstraps, but society providing them some straps to, to be able to pick themselves up with. And so these programs that some of you in here run and they're beautiful programs are incredible. Right? This is why I made it. So I got into these special programs and the condition was to enter under academic probation. Right? They, they were going to keep an eye on you. So, but the way I read it was, it said, you've been admitted under academic probation. I said, probation? I'm already on probation. That don't matter. <laughs> I pictured some guy following me around with a can of mace. <laughs> you know, so, you know, making sure I wasn't bullying the other students. So... I get to college, I get through college, four years later, working full time by the way, um, I wasn't satisfied and I kept talking to Ms. Russ in this process and I'm like, Ms. Russ, why am I not happy even though I'm getting a college degree? She goes, because you're meant to do bigger things, Victor. And I'm like, Ms. Russ, why do you see things that I don't see? This is what I call Educator projected self-actualization. You project for your students their self-actualization before they can even believe it, imagine it, or see it. And I'll talk about it a little more in a minute here. Educator projected self-actualization. You meant to do bigger things. Like what? She goes, I don't know, you gotta figure it out. I'm not gonna figure everything out for you. <laughs> well, I wanna be a doctor. But not medical school, because I didn't do so good in biology. I apply to Berkeley, a PhD program, get accepted. Takes seven years to do a PhD at Berkeley. Four and a half years into my program, in the year 2005, I became Dr. Victor Rios. Thank you. And so, I guess what I'm trying to say, educators, is that because of someone like you who provided me a second opportunity at life, I became who I am. Someone like you allowed me to find a key. And can you tell me what key you think my education provided me? 
Raise your hand and tell me. What key to the Mercedes? <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um, I did have one. We're an Audi family now, but I did have one in the past. Not baby blue. To happiness, what else? Freedom, success, education. Empowerment. My purpose, opportunity, self-empowerment. Self I'll tell you what key my education provided me. I graduated Berkeley on a Sunday. On a Monday, I'm at the bank asking for a home loan. A few weeks later, I get pre-approved. A few weeks later, I'm looking for a house. A few weeks later, close escrow. I get the key, put the key in my pocket. And I drive to my mom's dilapidated apartment. And I, and, and I knock on her door. And you know that look a mom gives you that she hasn't seen you in a while? Mm. She says, ¿Qué pasó, mijo? How are you doing, son? I'm nervous. My leg is shaking. I put my hand in my pocket. I pull out the key and I say, Mom, I'm sorry you had to wait 30 years to live in a proper place, but here are the keys to your house. You see, educators, the work that you do is about second chances. It could be about life or death for some of us. And it's about opening doors of opportunity that you might not even imagine you're opening. Because when I went to Miss Russ, you know how Miss Russ found out that she saved my life 20 years later? She read it in a book I wrote where one of the chapters is titled Miss Russ. <laughs> And by the way, we brought some, we only have like 14 copies of, but they'll be in the back after. But um, I ran out of copies. But the point is that uh, there, she was reading my book. And then she's like, wait, is she talking about me? <laughs> and she calls me. She goes, Victor, did you write a chapter about me? I said, yeah, Miss Rose, you saved my life. She goes, I didn't save your life. I was just doing my job. So she refused, and I would talk to her and talk to her, and she re finally one day I had coffee with her. And I said, Miss Russ, all these teachers are asking me, where are you from? Well, Miss Russ, where's Miss Russ from? Who is she? What's her story? I don't know. <laughs> and I'm embarrassed not to know your story. Well, I interviewed her about her life story, which I'll tell you about in another chapter. Beautiful story, by the way. And she starts crying. And she says, I really did save your life, didn't I? And I'm tearing up and I just go, Miss Russ, I've been telling you that for five years now. <laughs> she finally gave in. But a good educator is not doing it to be told, you know, you save lives. Good educator does it for their purpose, right? That's her job. That was her job, is to teach us properly and advocate for us and to make us into students, not, not subjects. Right? And so we have to reframe, as educators, we have to reframe the way we do education. We have to, and, and, and I know people tell you this all the time, let's reframe our education system. And I know, you veterans out there, Ms. Russell's a veteran. I know you know that every four or five years or so, there's a new fad in education. What's it gonna be, growth mindset now? Or mindfulness? Or, or is it cultural relevance? Or cultural proficiency, which one, tell me? Or is it gonna be 
um, cultural competence? Or is it going to be, you know, like all these new trends in education, and at the end of the day, good teaching is good teaching. Emotional connection is emotional connection. At the end of the day, we know what works because we're educators. That's what we're in the business of is inspiring, motivating, changing people's lives. So when I come and say to you, let's reframe education, I mean it in a very practical, pragmatic way. So for instance, when you see this picture, there's me throwing up a gang sign with my homies back in the day, and then there's a group of young men I'm studying in one of my books. One of them has a Hennessy bottle. He's out of school that day. It's a school day. He's 14 years old. This one has a giant blunt in his mouth. It's hard to see, but it's a huge, it's the biggest blunt. You know what a blunt is? It's like a marijuana stick, okay? It's like that big. It's like a marijuana log. And it was huge. It was big. I was like, whoa. I mean, I, I should have, I mean, I wasn't trying to do this, but if you turn sideways, you could really see how big that marijuana, I mean, no, no one needs that much marijuana. Anyway, <laughs> um, does society see them as at risk? 100%. At risk is still written into California education code. Some of you have to use it in your reports. <laughs> Some of you run programs for at-risk students. But what you label me determines how you will treat me. If you label me as a risk, you're going to treat me as a risk. I propose promise. Then that goes from a threat perspective to an asset perspective. From a deficit perspective. Where they're coming in with risk to an asset perspective. They're coming in with potential, with promise. And so here's some of the research that kind of backs some of this up. Support from authority figures was the strongest predictor of school appropriate behavior, positive attitudes towards school, and academic performance. When they're feeling supported by you, they do well. Emotional support is the key to student motivation and transformation. And let me show you a chart from a survey we conducted at Santa Barbara High School um, with 1,879 students. Look at this. For low-income students, low-income students, most of them reported needing emotional support. And also, a majority reported needing informational support. But look at the middle class students. Most of them needed informational support, and less of them, just 40%, compared to almost 85% here, needed emotional support. Think about it. You're educating two worlds. And yet, we have one cookie cutter approach to how to treat all 30 kids in that classroom. So the, the science is there. The evidence is there that emotional support is not some mushy stuff that that teacher that works with, who? The bad kids. We send the bad kids to that one teacher because they're good with those kids. Why isn't that teacher up here teaching us strategies every time at PD time? We know who you are. You're the teacher who all your colleagues send the difficult students to. Why are you up here teaching us? We don't place a value on that emotional support. That's what you're providing. That's what you're going to tell me. Well, let's learn some of your best practices so all of us become you. You don't need no outsiders coming in teaching you strategies. Use your own people. They're in this room right now. Why aren't they up here? Why isn't there material in that beautiful pamphlet on intersections and equity? Or maybe it is, my bad. But it's not, right? It is? Hmm. <laughs> Look at what the neuroscientists are saying. We feel, therefore we learn. 
the relevance of effective and social neuroscience to education. Now this is the brain scanning and the brain research is saying learning, attention, memory, decision making and social functioning are both profoundly affected by and subsumed within the processes of emotion. What does this mean? It means that if my learning pathway is blocked because I'm having a bad day because I'm angry or sad then I can't learn because it's the same pathway that is responsible for acquiring information and we seem to think because we separated the mind and the body in Western civilization what 400 years ago, 500 years ago, 400 years ago. Descartes, he says, there's the mind and then there's the body. And we still believe it. Some 400 year old idea. But neuroscientists are saying no. Emotion and learning and intellectual activity is all part of the same process. So in order to teach me you have to engage me. In order to educate me, you have to connect with me. Okay, so I'm going to conclude here pretty, pretty shortly. So let me just give you some of Ms. Russ's best practices. And what I can do is provide, is there a way to provide you my slides? Yeah. And then they could get distributed to? Yeah, yeah okay. send them to me. And you'll distribute them? Perfect. I'll send them out and that way you don't have to try to jot all this down. Okay, so Miss Russ's best practices in creative, creating positive mindsets. Social location. She understood we were, where we were coming from. She knew who we were. She would even once, you know, we thought she was crazy because like every other month she would drive into our neighborhood. <laughs> in her old Toyota Tercel. <laughs> 1982. <laughs> I would, was, no, no, I would never steal her car. Plus, she had a red club on it, so <laughs> she was too smart for that. Uh, anyway, she would come to our house, knock on our doors, and um, joke, my mom would open the door. My mom knew very little English, and my teacher knew very little Spanish, and the conversation went something like this. Oh, hola, senora. Hola maestra, como esta? Oh, bien. Um, Victor hasn't been in school. Uh, I'm worried about him. Oh, si maestra. Si maestra. Uh, senora, you want Victor to fail? Uh, si maestra. Si maestra. <laughs> like everything was, yes teacher, yes teacher. And so was that an utter waste of time for Miss Russ? No, because human connection has no language. She connected. My mom felt some obligation like, whoa, I better go to the school. I better get this kid in action. Whoa, that teacher, respect. She comes here, now I owe her. Human connection has no language. So when colleagues tell you, well, I don't speak the language. I don't know how I'm going to connect. You tell them, human connection has? Thank you. Educator projected self-actualization. You beam for them like this PowerPoint, you become that projector and beam for them what they will be in the future. It's not your job to tell them what they're not going to be. It's not your job to determine which kid is going to college or not. It's your job to prepare everyone equitably and then let their trajectories and their choices decide for them. One day Ms. Russ says to me, as I'm getting ready to go to college, Victor, one day you will advise presidents. <laughs> oh, Miss Russ. I don't know what you're talking about, lady. <laughs> 20 years later, I get invited to the White House to advise the Obama pres presidency uh, administration, the Domestic Policy Council on gun violence, policing in America. I get to shake Obama's hand.
Then I get to hang out with Mr. Joe Biden and Dr. Joe Biden, who is, what is she? A community college teacher. How many of you in here work at the community college? Raise your hand. All right, good for you. So, but I was nervous when I went to their house. I was really nervous. I was so nervous I had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and I go to the bathroom and I wash my hands and <laughs> with soap. And um, I wash my hands and I see these cool little paper towels with the seal of the Vice President of the United States of America. So I dry my hands with one of them, put it in the trash, grab a little stack, put it in this pocket right here, close up my jacket, shake the Vice President's hand, shake the uh, first, second lady's hand, say goodbye, come back to California with a little souvenir. <laughs> Listen, you can take me out of Oakland, but you can't take Oakland out of me. <laughs> but, but going back to the point that this lady saw me doing this before I could ever imagine it. That's what I'm trying to tell you. And that's what you need to be. You need to be projecting stuff these kids can't see. Why? Why shouldn't you? There's no reason why. False, false dreams, false, false hopes. No, you just push them forward. Let's see what happens, you know. Uh, help them prepare for it. Help them become those strivers. Learn the practical strategies to get there. Ms. Russ provided unconditional nurturing. That means if we um, got into it, had a conflict, she wasn't the type of person that would take it personal because she knew we were in another stage of development from her. Like the frontal lobe, the part of the brain responsible for reasoning, doesn't fully develop till you're about 20 years old. So when the teacher says, I don't ever see that student again, he cussed me out. You're stooping to their developmental level. You know? And that's not fair to them or to you as an educator. You should be that fully developed adult that knows how to reason in these kinds of contexts. Although some of us might argue that some of our colleagues haven't fully developed, but that's another conversation. Consistency, she was very consistent with all of us, right? She punished one of us for something, the other one did it, she would punish that individual too. And, um, well, I would love to keep going, but I know that time is short, but I just want you to reflect, as this is your homework. Go to Trader Joe's. Does Santa Maria have Trader Joe's? Man, you gotta love some Trader Joe's. <laughs> Customer service. They're really nice people. I'm having a bad day. I go there, the guy starts talking to me. I'm very annoyed. Before you know it, I'm like smiling. You know, they're very nice people. So Trader Joe's. So let's do the, the Trader Joe's challenge. Go do your homework, go to Trader Joe's, see how they treat you, and then go to your school and tell your colleagues, hey, Trader Joe's challenge. What's that? All of us are going to act like Trader Joe's employees to our children and to the parents and to co-workers, colleagues, and staff, and see what happens. You know what will happen? I'll tell you what. Omaha, Nebraska did the Trader Joe's challenge. I was just joking, and they did it. And you know what happened? The whole culture changed. Because when you treat people with dignity, respect, love, unconditional care, the whole culture changes. So maybe I'll come visit your school after the Trader Joe's challenge. So my teacher believed in me so much that she tricked me into believing in myself. Thank you so much for your time.